we should uh, pro pro also mention that Senator Leahy was instrumental in the uh, initiation of the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative. Uh, uh, from its inception, he and his staff, Bob pa Paquin as well, been very engaged and uh, it was through earmarks that first got us going uh, within uh, federal support for uh, the, all the work that the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative has done. Um, I can tell that it's getting close to the uh, beginning of a new year, not only because of the snow and ho holiday decorations, but uh, those of us that work out of the main office are getting a flurry of requests and responses from commissioners, agency secretaries, and others to uh, get reports ready for the beginning of the legislative session. Uh, and I won't mention what we call that in, uh, in, the, uh, in the main office. Uh, but our next speaker is uh, Representative Rebecca Ellis, and she's been a member of the Vermont Legislature since uh, 2011, and currently serves as the Vice Chair of the House Natural Resources uh, and Energy Committee. Uh, prior to her legislative work, Re Rebecca worked 14 years as an Assistant Attorney General uh, for the state of Vermont where she focused on land use and environmental uh, issues. Uh, Rebecca is very engaged in her community in Waterbury, serving on the Planning Commission and the Select Board and after a tropical storm Irene received an award for all the recovery efforts that she did to bring and get Waterbury back up on its feet. Uh, Rebecca is a graduate from Harvard University, Princeton University, and Georgetown University Law Center. And with that, uh, Representative Ellis. So it's my pleasure to be here today as a speaker and as Steve mentioned I am a state representative. I represent Waterbury, Bolton and Huntington and within my district is also Camel's Hump. So I like to tell people that when we climb to the top of Camel's Hump you can actually see my entire district. <laughs> um, I'm happy to be here today and give you some um, tips, actually sort of really nitty gritty stuff on how to make uh, an impact on policy and especially at the local and state level. Um, last week when I um, was preparing for this talk, I was actually in the midst also of reading an article in the New Yorker about um, Angela Merkel, who's the Chancellor of Germany. And I was surprised to find out that she was a scientist before she became a politician. And she actually has a PhD in quantum chemistry. And I was interested in figuring out what kind of traits as a scientist had made her a particularly um, effective politician. So according to the New Yorker article, she's um, been described as a keen observer of others, intensely curious about the world. I imagine that describes many of you. And as a scientist, Merkel learned to approach problems methodically, drawing connections, running scenarios, weighing risks, anticipating reactions, and then, even after making a decision, letting it sit for a while before acting. The article said that her scientific habit of mind is a key to her political success, and that she had learned self-discipline, strength of will, and silence as essential tools. As a politician, she listens well, she is calm, and she is decisive. So short of actually becoming a politician, which many of you or some of you might choose to do, um, what are some of the best ways you could have an impact on policy making? And I'd like to start by defining a little bit what is meant by policy making, because we've talked about it, um, Secretary Markowitz has talked about it, and Tom Berry has talked about it in several different contexts. So when I use the term policy making, I am talking about public policy making. So these are um, decisions that are made that, uh, that affect um, peoples and individuals and corporations rights and responsibilities. They're legal rights and responsibilities, and they're also decisions that affect um, spending. So we've heard a lot about that as well. But legal rights and responsibilities might include a person's obligation to adopt best available technologies, 
it, they may, um, those decisions might impact a person's responsibility or obligation to clean up a contaminated site or to pay for that cleanup or to reduce demands on natural resources such as air quality or water quality. And policy making happens at many different levels um, and in every, many different places within a level. So it happens at the local, regional, state, and federal level. But then even at a particular level, um, state level, you might see policy making at the agency um, and at the legislature. I'll use the use value appraisal program just as a quick example. The legislature creates policy every time it amends that program, which seems to be quite often since the program was started in about 1980. The um, Department of Forest Parks and Management and Recreation creates policy when it develops its guidelines um, for managing the forests. And there's currently um, some draft voluntary guidelines that are on the ANR website available for comment if you're interested in looking at that. The tax department makes policy when it decides consequences for withdrawing some or all of a parcel from the program, which could affect fragmentation issues. Um, and the courts engage in policy making when they adjudicate specific disputes that arise from the program, um, such as forest management practices and tax policy. I'd like to start, actually, um, by acknowledging, in particular, some of the work of the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative that's had an impact on the courts. And then I'll talk a little bit about policymaking at the local level and how to make an impact there. And then finally, some tips for making an impact at the state legislature. As an assistant attorney general, I was, um, and before I joined the legislature, I had the pleasure of working on a case with Dr. Tim um, Shrebatskoy, who was one of the founders of Vermont Monitoring Cooperative, cooperative on a case defending Vermont's mercury labeling law. So this was a law that was passed in 1998 and it required manufacturers of mercury containing products to label those products. And as um, happens with Vermont laws, the, the law was challenged by the manufacturers of fluorescent lamps, um, claiming that the law violated their First Amendment and their Commerce Clause rights. Dr. Sherbatskoy, who was involved with the Atmospheric Mercury Deposition Project, um, helped the state of Vermont establish that the improper disposal of lamps was a pathway for mercury to reach the environment. And as a result of his work and other scientists' work and policymakers' work, we were successful in defending that law. So you will now see on mercury or on any bulb that contains mercury, a little HG symbol. So helps customers identify mercury-containing products and dispose of them properly. Um, as, I th as we've heard already, um, data from the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative was also really essential in helping the um, states um, settle a case with the American Electric Power. Um, this was a case that was brought by Vermont and seven other states and the EPA um, against owners of, of coal-fired electricity plants in the Midwest. The monitoring data from the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative um, combined with meteorological data helped the states establish that there was a connection between the coal power plant and the acid rain in Vermont. Another landmark case that was assisted by data and monitoring data was decided in 2007, and that was Vermont's defense of the California Air Standards Rule, which was adopted by Vermont in 2005. So it's called the California Rule because it was first adopted there, and then it was adopted in Vermont, and it limited greenhouse gas emissions um, from cars. And again, the car manufacturers um, sued the state of Vermont, probably because they thought it was easier to sue Vermont than to sue California. Um, but Vermont prevailed anyway. Um, two scientists who testified in that case um, included NASA scientist Jim Hansen, from, who came to Burlington and testified about global climate change and global warming generally, and Dr. Barrett Rock from UNH, who used data from 350 different sites in New England to um, show that we were already seeing climate change in Vermont. 
And the court concluded, based on this evidence, that climate change would place at risk iconic elements of the Vermont experience and economy, including fall foliage, maple syrup production, and the ski industry. And the court found the statements of Dr. Hansen and Dr. Rock both reliable and helpful, which are key terms for um, lawyers. And the court upheld the rule. And if you haven't had a chance to read this case and the decision, it's really quite remarkable and pretty astonishing. It um, maybe is one of the first cases that really lays out that climate change is real and that it's happening. So it's actually a pretty um, exciting case, and it's exciting, I think, for, in Vermont to know that the data that's being collected here has been instrumental for this case and which will set precedent for other cases going forward. I also now want to give a plug um, for involvement at the local level um, and for scientists to become involved in the local policy, policy at that level. And it'll just be a quick little diversion, um, but I did want to use Waterbury as an example of where science can really help a, a local town um, move forward. Um, in 2011, when Tropical Storm Irene hit Vermont, I was chair of the Waterbury Select Board. And we were lucky to have on our select board an engineer, and also on our board of trustees, we had a retired um, director of the waste management division at ANR. Some of you may know Skip Flanders. And, com and just generally, the select boards um, in 2011 in Waterbury, the select board and the trustees, were pretty open minded and scientific inclined. And there was, as a result of that, we were able to work with local scientists to really try to figure figure out some of the issues in Waterbury about flooding. We put together uh, $30,000 to conduct some initial investigations of um, the Winooski River in that area. And then based on the findings from that, we've gone forward to request a $3 million grant from FEMA to help reduce the risk of flooding in Waterbury. Um, we also have been using um, some of the data from UVM's RAC program, the Research on Adaptation to Climate Change, to talk about the frequency and intensity of, of um, rainfall and precipitation in Vermont as a way to predict the future of flooding in Waterbury. And this is really important because um, FEMA generally uses past data and not forward-looking data. So we've been able to use some of the very recent data to look at future changes and therefore what is the monetary value of some of the um, floodplain reconnection strategies that we would like to pursue in Waterbury? We've also benefited, benefited from an EPA Lake Champlain Basin grant that was awarded to a, an engineering firm in Waterbury, again, looking at some of these issues and trying to monetize the values. Another area at the local level where um, scientists can really make a big impact um, is in land use. And I, I think that sometimes people don't realize that a lot of decisions are made at the local municipal level that affect um, the environment, water quality, air quality. And um, one of these things is how um, the zoning regulations that a, that a town or city will adopt and whether or not they are trying to encourage and promote downtown development or whether they're allowing um, development to occur at high elevations. So at about 10 years ago in Waterbury, we did adopt some high elevation and steep slope regulations. And it's the kind of issue that scientists can really, and people here in this room, can really be helpful in moving forward either as an active participant in the process um, or even on some of these boards, like the zoning boards or the conservation commissions. And it, it's only a small piece of the puzzle, but it really makes a difference. And if we have a lot of people working together in 250 towns, that will build a big body of good law and good local regulation. Um, turning now to the legislature, where I'm currently most active, I'm vice chair of the Natural Resources and Energy Committee. I'm going to give you eight tips for being um, successful um, in impacting legislation at, at the state level. Um, but I would, thought I'd start by giving you a few examples of the type of legislation that we deal with and that we hear about. Um, so.
My committee, the House Natural Resources and Energy Committee, um, in 2011, we took a lot of testimony that year on a renewable portfolio standard. And we took a lot of testimony, particularly about woody biomass in Vermont, the efficiency of wood as a source of electricity, the impact of increased harvesting on the health of Vermont forests, and the impact of increased harvesting on CO2 levels. In 2012 and 2013, we took testimony on procurement standards for forests um, in Vermont and harvesting guidelines for wood as an electric energy source. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the legislature directed ANR to issue um, some voluntary harvesting guidelines, and those guidelines are now available on ANR's website. And this past year, the spring of 2014, um, the Senate Natural Resources Committee took a, um, testimony on a forest fragmentation um, bill, S-100, and possible amendments to Act 250 to help promote um, the well, the non-fragmentation of the forests. Um, the legislature wasn't able to really resolve all the issues that were coming up, but directed the Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation to issue a report on forest fragmentation by January 15th of next year. So coming up in 2015, starting in January, we're likely to see some of similar issues. Um, we're very likely to see another proposal for a renewable portfolio standard for energy, which I believe will again probably raise issues about using forests to generate power and generate electricity. We're likely to see another bill on forest fragmentation. Um, we're likely to to see a bill um, proposing a carbon tax. And you know, there's probably other initiatives out there that you know about that I don't know yet about um, that will also come up. So how do you have an impact at the state level? The first tip is really define your goals. Um, do you want to comment on a bill that is in the committee and just tell folks that you support it or don't support it or make a little change here or there? Or do you want to be an active participant in the big process that leads up to, de to developing legislation and de developing the parameters for that legislation? And the, the bigger impact that you want, probably the earlier in the process you have to start. I do want to emphasize that the Vermont legislature is a very open place and if you do want to testify about a bill, that's actually very easy to do. All you have to do is call the committee assistant for the committee that's considering that bill. The committee assistant is a staff person, and that person will schedule you. Um, might sound a little easier than it is because you do have to know when the bill is going to come up in committee, and the schedule is usually only published on Monday of that week. But basically, it is a very open place, um, and your testimony and your comments would be welcome at any time. If you're planning to make a big impact, though, you really have to start early. Um, for big pieces of legislation, work on those pieces starts months, sometimes even years before the session starts. And I think this is actually where um, scientists can have the biggest impact, um, where you're developing the big contours of the bill. Um, sometimes the legislature will direct a study committee to develop legislation over the summer and fall. Um, sometimes the agencies will sua sponte, start their own study committees and develop some legislation. Sometimes stakeholders will start meeting and develop some ideas for legislation, sometimes with a legislator and sometimes without. So there's, um, but if you want to have a big impact and start a whole new policy, you really have to start early. The third tip is to identify partners. Um, whether you want to comment on a bill or have a big impact, you'll need to probably find other people who are in the state house watching legislation develop um, day to day, week to week. These are mostly trade associations and advocacy groups. Um, Jamie's here from Vermont Natural Resources Council. There's the Conservation Law Foundation, the Sierra Club, VPIRG, and other groups. These groups work on policy initiatives year-round, they develop relationships with legislators, they monitor the bills as they go through the House and the Senate, and they alert stakeholders such as yourselves when a committee is holding testimony. 
Um, it's really actually um, relatively easy to get a legislator to introduce a bill in the legislature, but really the trick is getting that bill through the whole process. So getting um, a committee interested in the bill, getting a committee to take testimony on the bill, getting the committee interested in actually voting on the bill, getting the bill to the House floor, the Senate floor, and then doing the same thing all over again in the other chamber. So you really need to have partners in order to do this. I thought it might be interesting for you to know, since um, this group is primarily interested in forest health, who testified on the forest fragmentation bill this last spring. So I looked up the bill, S100, on the legislative website. So this is another thing you should know about, is that there is a legislative website which has tons of information on it. You can look up a particular bill, you can find out who testified about that bill, and you can also, if there's any written testimony, read the written testimony that was submitted on that bill, and it's updated daily, so it's very current. The folks who testified on the forest fragmentation bill included four trade organizations, the Vermont Woodlands Association, the Vermont Traditions Coalition, the Forest Products Association, and the Associated Industries of Vermont. There were um, four foresters who testified um, from Green Mountain Forestry, um, one from Wagner Forest Management, Jonathan Wood, who's also the former ANR secretary, and Robo Holleran, who I don't know. There were representatives from two advocacy groups, Jamie Fidel from the Vermont Natural Resources Council and Gil Livingston from the Vermont Land Trust. And the agency also um, testified, Michael Snyder, the commissioner, testified. There was also an attorney who was um, sort of a forestry, um, forest management type attorney and one or two other people. So this was a Senate committee. I actually didn't hear the testimony, but I know some of the names and you might know some of them as well and you might have a sense of what their testimony was about. You can also look up their written testimony online. But I think um, for your purposes, what's important to look at is, was your point of view represented um, before the committee? Um, if it was represented, was it adequately represented? And if your point of view was not um, represented, is there a group, some kind of advocacy group, um, that you could align yourself with to make sure that your point of view gets before the committee? And again, this is all a matter of getting partners and getting to know people. So that leads to the fourth tip in Vermont, um, I guess anywhere, but especially in Vermont, get to know your legislators. Um, you should certainly get to know your own legislators later um, from your district. Um, you should also try to get to know, if possible, if it makes sense, some of the legislators from the relevant committees, which for forestry issues would be the House and Senate Natural Resources Committees, um, members of the House Agriculture and Forest Products Committee, probably the House Ways and Means Committee, probably the Senate Finance Committee, and it depends on the bill, it might go somewhere else. Um, and just a tip, um, you should definitely try to get to know the chair of the committee, or maybe the vice chair, but definitely the chair. Uh, a lot of um, decisions are made by the chairs as to the movement of bills um, through a committee. When the legislature's not in session, it's a great idea to invite your legislator or group of legislators to meet you at a research facility, in a forest, at a monitoring station. It's great to hear that Senator Leahy and folks went to the top of Camel's Hump, I think it was. You know, that actually makes a big impact. One trip like that, if you can get folks to take a trip like that, you know, that'll stick with them for 20 years, probably. <laughs> um, and I will say that the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative, and all of you here, you do a great job working with each other, working with the Agency of Natural Resources, um, the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, Steve Sinclair. Um, but just keep in mind that the agency does not represent the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative or you as individuals when they're in the State House. So if you want to have an impact, you actually have to make your own connections as well, either with particular legislators or with your partners who also have connections with legislators. Um, the fifth tip, and I heard this earlier, is to get to know other stakeholders in the process. Um, you might not be completely aligned with other people who are working on a bill, but it's great to get to know them, develop relationships with them. You might be surprised to find you have some common ground. You might even be able to work on certain parts of the bill, some definitions section, who knows what. Um, but I'll just say that odd bed bedfellows can surprise legislature and really help a bill move 
move forward. So it's important to reach out to everybody. Um, six, remain flexible. Um, the legislative process, the process is a little dirty and you have to be willing to compromise. So you really also have to know if you're working intensively on a bill, um, what is your bottom line? Is there enough in this bill to keep fighting for? Um, always remember that it's much, much easier to kill a bill than to get a bill passed. So if you like parts of the bill, think twice about trying to kill it and don't let perfection be the enemy of the good. Um, the seventh tip is to keep your testimony simple. I heard this earlier too. Um, unless you're the lead sponsor or advocate on a bill, you, your time before the committee might be limited to 10 minutes. You might have up to 30 minutes. If you have a handout, you should probably keep it to two pages or less. Um, if you do a PowerPoint presentation, that's great, but anything that you're handing out for people to hold on to should really be short. Um, legislators are pretty bright on the most, for the most part, um, but few of them have science backgrounds and they really don't have too much time to get into detail on a lot of issues. You should, um, if you're going to testify, you should find out from the committee assistant um, how much time you'll have, how far along the committee is in considering the bill, what are the sticking points in the legislation. If it's the first day that the committee is hearing the bill, you'll probably want to direct your testimony one way. If it's the last day, you're going to need to be quick and you need to know that too. And so your testimony will vary depending on where in the process you get fit in. And in most instances, it'll really be your job as a witness just to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down, whether or not you support the bill or not, whether or not the bill reflects current science, um, and to provide some simple but peer-reviewed evidence for your position. And the committee members will be tracking um, who's supporting the bill, who doesn't. Committees like to see a lot of consensus on bills. Um, they usually won't go to a floor vote on a bill unless there's unanimity in the committee. So, you know, it crosses party lines in a committee. Um, so just to keep that in mind as, as background when you give your testimony. And I did put a little note in my notes here to, to mention that the Senate may um, operate differently. They may not be seeking consensus, but in the House that's generally the rule. Um, so eighth and the final tip is to be positive, um, be pleasant. The, I like to remind people that legislators are people too and they have feelings too. They're doing their best to resolve differences, deal with a lot of competing demands and come up with some good law. Um, getting angry or frustrated is probably not a good strategy because you live in Vermont. Every Everyone knows everyone um, and don't burn your bridges. So those are my eight tips for making an impact. Um, not every scientist can be the leader of a world power like Angela Merkel, but I think all of us can make a big difference in our local communities. So thank you for leaning in and good luck. Break sounds like a good idea, huh? But I'm happy to take questions and I'll be here to having some more coffee. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very <laughs> Thank you. All right, so we have uh, break.